uh, make sure you have a bulletin handy. Make sure you have a hymnal handy, because we'll do church another way today without the TV. Do we have any announcements today? I want to remind you that Tuesday is meeting night, 6.30, uh, council meeting and then board meeting. Uh, and I think that's it. Any others? The flowers are out here, the spring flowers, and people at the bottom need to pick Okay, if you bought uh, spring flowers, this is what was left to share the beauty of today. And the rest are back there. If you want to pick it up and take it home and plant it or whatever, uh, they're back there. Thank you. Any others? Okay, then let us begin our worship.
Okay, Psalm 16, page 748. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. I have a glorious heritage. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. The Lord is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad and my soul rejoices. My body also dwells secure. For you do not bring me out of the shield, or let your godly ones see the pit. You show me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Will you please stand for the glory of Patre? Visitation? Does anybody visitation know? Visitation is tonight from 4 to 6. Okay. <coughs> I believe that's right. I think it's 4 to 6, so thank you, Mary Kay. So. Well, we, had a, we had a concern last night. We got a text from our daughter, and she said that they were in the emergency room with our granddaughter. She, The granddaughter is allergic to peanuts. Okay. And somehow the other, she ate something that had some nuts in it, and so they uh, were trying to get uh, that taken care of before okay it got to be serious. I, yeah, I think so. And that can be very serious and scary, yeah. I'm sure. So I'm glad they're doing better today. It's nice to have you and Lois back today, too. Today's Jace's birthday. Today's Jace's what? Third? Fourth. Fourth birthday. Okay. Any others? <clears throat> okay, then uh, we're going to change the prayer again. Uh, we're going to sing 328. The, the joy of being the second service is that song listed did not work in the first service, so we get to sing something different here. So 328, uh, surely the presence of the Lord is in this place. It's 328. surgery and granddaughter after uh, having an allergic attack. 
For all the others who are healing from things, we give you thanks. We thank you for a, a successful prom last night, that they could celebrate uh, being teenagers in a wonderful way. Lord, we just thank you for life. You're an incredible God who loves us amazingly enough. Lord, we do have concerns on our hearts, and some we share and some we keep silent. Lord, for Marvin Mercer and his family, we lift them up. May we celebrate Pat's life tomorrow and remember all the ways in which she was a part of our community, a part of our church, how precious she was to her family. Help us as we celebrate her life and be with Marvin and her kids, that they too may realize how much Pat is loved and how now she's in a place of no pain and no sorrow and, and no crippling effects of any kind. Lord, we also lift up our, our neighbors right here to our church. To Danelle and Laney and Jace and Autumn who lost um, their son and brother this week. We pray for their family as they continue to grieve over the loss of a child. We think it's hard sometimes to lose grown-ups, to lose grandparents. But Lord, we can't fathom what it would be like to lose such a young child. Wrap your arms around their house. Cover their house with your, with your love and your faithfulness. Let them know, the kids and Danelle, that, that they are loved. And in the midst of such crisis, in the midst of such tragedy, you are still there. You are never gone. And that Lane, the little boy, is safe and secure. Lord, for all the other things in our life that trouble us, help us to give them to you to let go of our, of our frustrations, to let go of our anger, to let go of, of whatever holds us back from worshiping the risen Christ. Be with us as we worship this day. To remember that just a week ago we celebrated Easter, and now we continue in the Easter season of celebrating Jesus and the fact that he rose from the dead and lives. Hear us now, O oh Lord, as we join together in the prayer that your Son taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Feel the here, the world is 
gifts and bless those who gave them. Help us, Lord, in this Easter season to be the hands and the feet, the voice of Christ. Help us to give up our time and our talents, our gifts, our service, all that we are to you. Bless this church as we use these gifts to be that light in our community and in our world. In your son's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Our scripture reading today from the New Testament is 1 Peter 1, 3 through 9. Praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you who through faith has shield, are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth, even through refined, though refined by far, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We please stand for our gospel lesson. Our gospel lesson is a, a lesson that we always get the week after Easter, and it's actually the story of Doubting Thomas. And it is in our scripture immediately following um, when Mary ran and told the, the disciples what they believed, and then this continues with John 20, verse 19. On the evening of the first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the door locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So that the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But Thomas said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand in his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. And though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. You may be seated. I like to, to look at the Peanuts comic strip, and I have another one today. Now, Charlie Brown is walking with Lucy, and they walk home on the last day of school. Now, Charlie Brown says to Lucy, Lucy, I got straight A's. Isn't that great? And Lucy, which I never understand why Charlie Brown sticks with Lucy, but he does. Lucy 
in her typical fashion, shoots down poor Charlie Brown and says, I don't believe you. Unless you show me your report card, I cannot believe you. Well, seeing is believing. Most people have to see something before we can believe it. It is often how we describe the Apostle Thomas, but is it really accurate? Before we say it's only Thomas, have you ever felt like you missed something big that everyone else seemed to know? Have you ever felt like maybe you weren't spiritual enough because of past failures? Have you ever felt like you could, you could really believe even more if you could just see Jesus just for a second? If you have ever felt this or anything like this, you would be in good company with Thomas. Thomas has been given a, a fairly difficult stereotype through the centuries because he is so often referred to as doubting Thomas in a, in a negative way. But I'm going to look at Thomas a little closer. What do we know about Thomas? Well, first, we know that he was likely a fisherman. Thomas was probably a fisherman by trade because that's where Jesus found him. The Gospel of John includes Thomas with several other disciples who joined Peter fishing all night. Now this was not a wonderful casual fishing trip, but rather it was a means of trade and income. In other words, it was work. It also makes sense that Thomas would have been a fisherman because many of the early followers of Jesus came from the area around the Sea of Galilee. Fishing would have been a major source of work in that area. Thomas was used to seeing the fish to believe you'll get paid. <coughs> Secondly, Thomas was a follower of Jesus. <laughs> Thomas was a disciple of Jesus from the earliest days in Jesus' public <coughs> ministry. We know this because it was one of the qualities that was used to replace Judas as the apostle in the book of Acts. Thomas had made the choice to follow Jesus and invested his life into seeking more and more of Jesus. Third, Thomas was an apostle. Out of all the, the followers of Jesus, there were many. There were 12 that were chosen to be apostles. Thomas had become one of the core leaders and spent just about every day for around three years with Jesus. Fourth, Thomas was loyal and committed. A few weeks ago in worship, we read the story about Lazarus, and that Lazarus had died, and Jesus was going to go raise him from the dead. And where they lived, there was increasing hostility from the religious authorities. The disciples told Jesus, don't go there, they're trying to kill you. But it was Thomas who said, let us go with you, that we may die with you. Does not sound like the words of a doubter. Fifth, Thomas was confused. As Jesus was preparing his disciples for his coming death and resurrection, he told them that he was going to go to prepare a place for them and that they would know the way to where they were going. Thomas very clearly shows that he didn't always understand Jesus because he said, how are we going to know where you're going? But if Thomas was such a loyal follower of Jesus, what happened to him? How did he go from a follower of Jesus to a famous skeptic or doubter? Well, Thomas, along with the other 12 disciples, were on a downward spiral. Thomas had deserted Jesus. On the night, we say Thursday before Easter, on that night that Jesus was arrested, all of the disciples ran. They all ran and deserted Jesus. Thomas was no exception. He ran, Jesus died. Can you imagine the kinds of emotions that Thomas was experiencing? He was afraid, afraid he might be next to be crucified. He would have been confused. What, what just happened? He would have been dismayed and distressed and, and any other emotions. He had followed Jesus for years and now it all came crashing down around him. Now for some reason, and we don't know why, Thomas doesn't go back to the upper room to be with his brothers in Christ. We don't know where he was. We don't know what he was doing. We don't know why he stayed away. But for whatever reason, Thomas does not come back to the community of Christ, to the body of Christ. 
The result of that is that Thomas loses out on one of the most incredible <coughs> things of all on that first Easter. He doesn't get to see Jesus. So when Thomas does return, his friends, his, his apostles say, Jesus was raised from the dead and we've seen him. The greatest event in all of history, and Thomas missed it. Jesus was alive, and Jesus knew that Thomas wasn't there. Thomas doesn't know what took place or how it took place, and Jesus will appear again or anything else about the resurrection. All he knows is that he missed it. So Thomas begins to deny the testimony of the humans there. He never says, I don't think Jesus did it. He told them, I need to see. Thomas denies the testimony of the apostles and leads him to demand proof. Thomas tells the others, I won't believe what you say until I see Jesus for myself. And then he goes a step further and says, I want to touch Jesus, the, the holes in his hands and the spear in his side. I want to touch it. Thomas was quickly caught in a dangerous downward spiritual spiral. The fact is he was slipping quickly and no one but Jesus could get him out. So they stay in the upper room. Thomas was given a specific demonstration. A week goes by and no appearance of Jesus. I have no idea what Thomas was thinking, but it could not have been a very good week. Thomas was left to his lack of focus. And just when Thomas may have been ready to give up on himself and everything else, Jesus appeared. Jesus once again appears in the room and greets everybody, peace be with you. And then he turns to Thomas. Now at this point, I would think Thomas would be thinking, uh-oh, here comes Jesus. He's going to tell me how horrid and rotten I am, what a terrible person I am. But Jesus knew the heart of Thomas. Because Jesus offers him exactly what he was asking for. Jesus gave him the proof he needed. It was important to note that Jesus didn't seem offended or angered by the request. <coughs> Jesus responded with love and kindness. And then Jesus begins to speak. He begins to speak to Thomas about the real issue and cuts right to the chase. Jesus tells Thomas, stop doubting and believe. Well, what does it mean to doubt? There are two main definitions of doubt. One means to be double-minded or have a lack of focus or commitment. The second means to have no faith at all. Jesus was telling Thomas that was moving toward having a faithless life, stop and believe. There are times in our life when doubt is healthy and reasonable. For instance, I seriously doubt the reliability of Elvis being alive in Hawaii. He might be there. I don't believe it. But there is more than enough reason to believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. Jesus was crucified. He was dead and buried. The tomb was empty. He was seen by many people and the apostles were changed in radical ways after that first Easter. So doubt doesn't have to be negative, and it's not negative until it leads you to choose not to believe. This is exactly what Jesus was warning Thomas about. Literally, Jesus was saying, Thomas, you're acting like a person who has no faith. Stop it and believe. The only way to survive your doubt is to believe. Now, we don't believe everything that comes our way, and that's okay, but we have to believe in Christ. Believing means to put your complete trust in someone or something. To believe in Jesus means you depend totally on Jesus and place your trust in him 100%. Thomas, after this happened, <clears throat> gave a dynamic declaration. Thomas, after he hears the words of Jesus, falls before Jesus and proclaims that he is Lord and God. Thomas goes from demanding evidence to declaring the truth. Thomas says that Jesus is the Lord of all things and the God of all creation. 
This is one of the greatest statements of faith in the entire New Testament. Thomas made a personal declaration of trust in Jesus. Jesus tells Thomas that he believed because he saw and was convinced. Well, maybe you have been caught in a downward spiral and things have been slipping through your spiritual life. Maybe you have never put a claim to put your trust in Jesus. Maybe you're waiting for the chance to see some little bit of proof. Well, Jesus is with us now by the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. He is waiting for us to turn from our doubt, our lack of focus, to proclaim him as our Lord and our God. I don't know where you are on the journey this morning, but Jesus does. And just as he knew what Thomas needed so long ago, he knows today what you need, and he is waiting to meet that need when we ask. Remember, Thomas missed it because he wasn't with the community of believers. Remind <laughs> us all to always be with our families. Amen. Would you please stand and join me in our um, affirmation of faith, number 881. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From hence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the everlasting. Amen. Let us join our hymn, Crown Him with Many Crowns, number 327.